I've been working in this field, this cause, as you call it, for about 30 years. And I thought I had the answer, but I didn't really have the answer as to why I'm here until a few years ago. It was June of 2011. I had moved back home to Texas from LA to be close to my family, and I had some ideas about changing the laws in Texas to allow private space vehicles to be able to be flown, and, but uh, really to be close to my family. And so what was really interesting was what was working underneath that was that I was given an opportunity to be with my mom, my little English mother, um, for about two months. And, you know, she, she was a powerhouse. She had started Meals on Wheels and uh, food kitchens and all of these kinds of things in, there, uh, in, the, uh, in the state there. And um, it was amazing to be with her because they had just moved into their dream house out in the country for the first time. And, and then she died. After six weeks struggling after an accident, we lost her. And so there I was with my father, who we still call Sarge, by the way, just to give you an idea. And I had walked out into the pasture at night. And it was amazing. It was beautiful. It was so quiet, so dark. Just a sliver of the moon in the sky. There were horses in the pasture. I could hear the crickets, the cicadas, the breeze rustling the trees. And I was broken. I was crushed. This woman had shaped my life, shaped who I am. I was always like, I want mom to see. She wasn't there anymore. And I went out into that pasture and I was just standing there. I was wondering, why am I doing this? Who am I? Now look, just to give you some background, I was born in a period of time, uh, Malcolm Gladwell wrote a book about it. Um, and uh, you know, it, it, it's a, uh, a group of people who were kind of raised in the 60s and 70s. We, we kind of grew up with Apollo, uh, we were in a Cold War. I remember we used to have to dive under desks, not for a, a shooter, but because there might be a nuclear weapon coming in. Now, fat lot of good that's going to do you, but you know, it, that's what we were doing at that time. And it was a very interesting contrast in our lives. We would, I can remember sitting there watching the television and using the remote control, which was my little brother, and flipping the channels you know, back and forth, and you would see you know, there's, a, there's a Vietnam and... and Weapons on parade, and uh, you know, and then there's uh, Apollo, and and we're seeing the Earth for the first time from space, and then Star Trek. Now, I was a little asthmatic geek nerd, a dork, whatever you want to call us. I was that. I'm not a billionaire. I don't come from a billionaire family. Like I said, we call my dad Sarge. He had three jobs. I remember going with him on Saturday mornings at five o'clock to clean the bowling alley. The smell of Cigarettes and beer, I can still smell that. But what I was seeing as I was flipping those channels was possibility. I was seeing a choice of life, of what the future could be, what I could be. And I, and I have to tell you, seeing there, and wow, they're, they're driving on the moon. We're sending Voyager and these vehicles out into space to explore the universe. And then there's Captain Kirk. I mean, come on, right? And, I was inspired. There was a generation of us that were inspired. We moved into the 70s, and during that period of time, we were being promised. Now, it was kind of sad. It was actually very sad in that we had gotten hooked on this idea that we were going out. We were going out into the universe. And then, after the most expensive selfie in human history with Buzz and Neil taking their shot, like, yo, free enterprise, democracy, we win, they killed the program. And all that was left was flags and footprints and us, us, a generation of young people who had grown up and given ourselves what I call permission to dream. And we had this dream that we could do something. We could make something grand happen. We could create a great future because if they're driving on the moon, if we're doing Voyager, and then there's Star Trek, of course, in the mind of a child, that rolls together, of course. But then we were let down by what happened with Apollo. And now in the middle of that, we were being promised a thing called the space shuttle. The space shuttle was going to come along. It was going to save the day. 50 times, uh, you know, 50, uh, 50 times a year, it was going to fly into space. $100 a pound. I know you're calculating your body weight right now. And you know, we would be able to go. And there was a guy who wrote a book in the middle of this called The High Frontier, Gerard K. O'Neill. 
And in this book, he basically said, you don't have to be an astronaut. You don't have to be a scientist. You don't have to be in the military. You can be anybody. Just take your dreams, your imagination, the resources of space, democracy, a free enterprise, and go expand humanity into the universe. And he began to call us together once a year in Princeton for a conference. And we would all gather together. And uh, Gerard K. O'Neill was there. We used to call ourselves Jerry's kids. Uh, we were the misfit toys. We would come together and start thinking about these things. And he'd be down there in the front like, like I am now, you know, and we'd be doing our talks and, and, and these kind of things. He'd be sitting over here with Freeman Dyson, his partner. And they would be like, yeah, this is interesting. And it inspired us because they believed in us. Dr. O'Neill believed in us. I remember his, uh, his number two guy. <laughs> I, I volunteered, by the way, to work for Dr. O'Neill. Um, I had uh, come to New York City. And they had no space group here. So I started an organization out on the Intrepid. And we would have meetings once a month. And eventually, I heard about this institute that he had in Princeton. And I volunteered. I literally said, I will sweep the floors. Just let me help you. Just let me be a part of this. And I remember um, his number two guy. I, as you can see, I'm a little bit chatty, right? And so his number two guy would leave me in the car whenever he went to see Jerry so that they could have a conversation. But Dr. O'Neill was so kind and, and so wonderful that Whenever we were close to each other, he would ask me my thoughts, me. And I would answer him, and I would tell him these ideas I had. That's very interesting. Why don't you work on that? Why don't you do that? And so I began to develop this idea that I could make a change in the world, that I could make something happen, maybe. Now, as it turned out, this thing about the space shuttle turned out to be a lie. It was an aerospace industrial complex lie. The most it ever flew was like five times a year. The price was $10,000 a pound and stayed there for 25 years. Some of us got a little angry. So I became an activist. So I went into working in Washington and, and doing what we call changing the conversation. We went to war with the aerospace industrial complex. Eventually, we were able to change the laws that allowed the private sector to fly into space. We went into all kinds of different activities where we could begin to allow the people themselves to participate in space, prying the aerospace industrial complex's fingers off of the frontier. And then things started to happen. We started to create companies and projects and ideas, uh, going out and doing things. And, um, and yes, later on, the guys showed up. I call them the billionaire cavalry. <laughs> they showed up. And look, I, I want to be really clear. Whatever their faults are, whatever their employment practices are, whatever it is, that you don't like about these folks in these particular areas, they are doing something important. These guys aren't going into space to make money. They made their fortunes to go into space. In fact, Jeff Bezos, for example, had a book in his collection in high school called The High Frontier by Dr. O'Neill. He gave his valedictorian speech and said, I'm going to make money, and then I'm going to open space so that any kid, you know, any kid in the dorm room can do what I did with Amazon, go out into space, and create the future. It may not be PC to talk about it that way, but everybody has something, some part of them. People are complex. Everybody has some part of them that is to the good and working for the good. In this case, it's that. And so here we were. I'd, I'd gone through this whole revolution, and it was almost right around the same time where these first commercial flights were starting to take place. And I walked out into that pasture, and again, I was lost. I was devastated. Now, at the time, I had all the rational reasons for why we go into space. You know, we're, we can help observe the Earth. We can find resources out there. We can, you know, do all kinds of different things. Uh, space solar power to help save the planet. All of these wonderful ideas. But they're very linear. These are sort of spreadsheet ideas. These are standard answers that, that we had to give at the time to the establishment. But as I walked out into that field, Cracked open, my shield's down, to use a Star Trek analogy. I walked out into that field, and there I was, lost. And I, I heard a voice saying, I love you. And it wasn't my mom, because I knew she loved me. I realized in my soul that it was this earth. It was the mother world, my other mother that I was loved as a human being. As badly as I and the rest of us have treated her, she loved us. She loves us. 
And at the same time, I, I kind of felt a draw. I felt an, another voice saying, come, come join us, come. And that's when I looked up, and I fell upwards into the sky, into the night sky, allowed my soul to fly up into the universe itself and feel, become one with, understand, have a union with this universe that we're a part of. And I realized that while the arguments, the points, the debates, the action, the financing, all this other stuff that we had been doing for so long was so important, there was actually something bigger going on here. Something huge, something at the scale of, beyond Copernicus, at the scale of crawling out of the oceans onto the land, spreading your wings and learning to fly. I realized that I had a purpose, that we have a purpose. And it took me a little while to learn, to figure out how to articulate it, to, to bring it together. But for me, it became clear that the purpose I have, the stand that I take now, the place that I am in and where I speak from, that vision that I wake up with and powers me through the day and will for the rest of my life, the message I am trying to give to the world is that we have a purpose. And I've heard the word purpose at the individual level here. And this is that, but this is bigger. See, I believe we have a purpose in terms of the universe. And I'll break it down into what I call three principles. Number one, to protect and expand the domain of life. To take care and cherish of the, the mother world, but to carry her seeds out. Number two, to honor and evolve civilization. To understand where we come from, to look at it from all of the possible perspectives. Imagine we're standing on a line on the edge of this frontier, and out here is the undiscovered country of the universe. And we're all standing here about to step into this. For the first time in human history, we have the ability to look back at where we've come from, what we've done wrong, and try and get it right. You know, Me Too, Black Lives Matter, you know what that is? That is other people stepping up into a world that's basically been, whose history has basically been written by one section of our society and going, you know what, I see it from this. It's different than what you've been telling us. Or you know what, I see it from this way. So we can synthesize all of that into our view of history for the first time. You know, the people that moved into Rome after the collapse of the Roman Empire thought it had been built by giants. We don't have to live in those illusions. We can understand where we have come from. And we can try to do better as we move out. We can grow. You know, there, are, there is no closer family than a group of people living in a bubble in a place that wants to kill you. You know, it's like the Russian cosmonaut showing up in yellow. These people love each other. They care about each other. And last, though, this is the fun one to explore and experience everything in the universe. To break out, to get up off of our global couch, to put down the freaking remote, to take off the VR headsets, to engage in life, to engage in the universe, to step out as a civilization into this incredible cosmic possibility that has been given to us, and to make of it something grand and exciting. Imagine a child growing up in a society that doesn't care how many Teslas you have, how much crypto you own, how much land you have grabbed from the country next door, but cherishes instead your mind, your ability to realize the unreasonable, your ability to try, to expand, to study, to learn, to teach, to become more than you are. It is where we become human. It is how we join with God. Thou art God. We are the way the universe knows of itself. It is only by experience from sentient creatures like us, somebody else having Ted Zugel out on the other end of the galaxy, sitting in a room like this, who are both stepping out into that universe, that the universe becomes real for itself. It is how it knows of itself. Otherwise, it is all rocks and energy forever and ever and on. We have a purpose. You have a purpose. In your own lives, in your own love, in your own families, in your own communities, in your own societies, 
wherever you are, you have a purpose, a very, very high purpose. And as human beings, we have a purpose. And to me, we are here to go there.